This is the Forbes Books Podcast, conversations with folks who are impacting the world of business and beyond. Hola, I'm Joe Partavilla, and we all know everybody's busy. But have you ever wondered how to write messages that get the attention and response of busy readers? Whether you're sending an email, a text, a tweet, or a report, you want your writing to be clear, concise, and compelling. But how do you achieve that in a world where people are constantly bombarded with information and distractions? Well, Todd Rogers has the answer. He's the professor of public policy at Harvard University, where he teaches and conducts research on the science of effective communication. Together with his colleague, Jessica Lasky-Fink, he has written a new book called Writing for Busy Readers, and it is an essential guide for anyone who wants to write better in the real world. Todd, welcome to the podcast. Hi, Joe. Thanks for having me. You're very welcome. And so, Todd, you know what's fascinating to me? And you, I'm sure, as a college professor, can relate to this to a certain extent. For years, we've been hearing about the fact that people have no attention span. The technology is destroyed. We're all, we're all goldfish. We all have six seconds to concentrate. Yet, some of the most engaging and popular forms of media, whether it's a podcast like this, can go upwards of two to three hours people listen. Long-form written content, whether it's a blog or an article in uh, The Atlantic or Vanity Fair, could be thousands and thousands of words and people read it. Talk to me about that dichotomy where we do have a short attention span, but we love this long form content. It's a good question. I think of it as a few different ways. First, most things we read are not long form content. I bet less than 2% of all content is long form content, but there are more people reading it than maybe in the past. So maybe there is a hunger for some kind of long form immersive entertainment. Listening to people talk, totally different game. It's, it's recreational and enjoyable. I'm not sure that my students listening to me lecture are enjoying it more than they used to. Right. So it's sort of like there's like I think that I think there's a there's different purposes. And actually the narrow purpose of what we're talking about in the book, in my research, and on this pod is practical writing. Like writing where we have some professional or or practical purpose. It is not recreation. And people are not psyched to read it. They are not seeking it out. In fact, their goal in every turn is to move on as quickly as possible. I want to get into the genesis of the book, but when did you start writing this? Because I, I want, I'm trying to figure out the AI timeline of it all. Because obviously AI has been around for years, but November 22 is when ChatGPT kind of went mainstream. When did you start writing this book? And then when did you kind of bump up against, holy crap, people are going to start using AI to write, write easier than ever before? Yeah, we, uh, we were wrapping up the book as ChatGPT came out. And we only in the final chapter talk about it, but I've spent a lot of time thinking about it. I've got, uh, I've written about it. I've, I actually, we have a trained LL, large language model trained on the principles of how to write so busy people read and respond. And what, one thing is chat GPT and all large language models, generative AI are copy the way we were taught to write basically all the writing that exists. And we were taught to write well, not how to write effectively for busy people. And so when you write using these kind of tools, it improves the quality of our writing in the style of the way people write, which is good writing, clear sentences, complete sentences. What we have discovered in our research and working with leaders across industries is that writing effectively is different than writing well. Eventually, the LLMs will learn how to do that because it's easy to learn. We've trained a large language model on our website to write according to these principles and they can edit your writing according to these principles. But currently it's trained on what we currently know about writing well, which is what your high school English teacher would be happy with. Okay. So I want to thread that needle of well and effectively in a second, but one more question. So uh, this summer I spoke to the president of the college of Charleston, Andrew Hsu, and I brought up the question about AI in schools and what the, I guess the future looks like in terms of testing and, and uh, teaching kids. And one of the things we joked about was, oh, well, I should mention Andrew Chu is originally from China. So I said, hey, look, you're originally from a communist country. In those countries, when they don't want you to access a site, they shut it down or whatever the co or the word, you know, Winnie the Pooh, whatever, whatever right. it is, you can't do that. But I wonder if colleges will take, and again, that's an aggressive sort of analogy there, but is there a way that colleges may down the road have to block these websites, block these AI chatbots? Because- uh, what Andrew said was like, there's no way because students will find a way. It's sort of like, you know, Jurassic Park. <laughs> Life will find a way. But what's your thoughts about the future of this intersection of AI and education? 
it doesn't bother me that much because these are tools that people have access to. And my goal, particularly because I don't, I'm not focused typically about writing. I'm typically focused on what I call behavioral science, the science of behavior change. And in teaching that, we often communicate through writing. And I am happy to have people uh, use tools to clarify or improve their writing. That said, it's still pretty easy to, I'll have an assignment, say, how did you use this tool, this behavioral insight to, you know, to improve social welfare? What ideas did you come up with in 400 words or less, describe it and how you do it. Pretty easy to get ChatGPT to write that. My general approach, and again, I teach grad students at Harvard, they're adults. If they want to cheat themselves from doing the work, like they're choosing to be here anyway, I'm pretty laissez-faire about it. Not even different. But if you want to cheat yourself, don't come to class. If you want to cheat yourself, don't do the work. And I also think it's kind of not a game we can win anyway. So I leave it to student responsibility. And one of the things Andrew mentioned, it might be, he might have been, he might have said it in jest, but he goes, we may go down the road of going back to the future of the blue book. Remember the old blue book where you have to take your test in the class and it was that little crappy little, little with the small lines or if you had terrible penmanship, no one could understand what you're writing anyway. Do you see that as a possibility that schools, and obviously you're at the grad school level, but do you see down in the undergrad level where they may be like, okay, everybody take your pens and pencils because we're going to be using blue book on these tests. I mean, my approach again is if students want to cheat themselves, they can. If I wanted to paternalistically force them to not use any tools that would enhance their performance relative to other kids or other students. Then yeah, I, I can see that. I mean, I, I, I actually am moving towards my exam, which has always been take home one hour honor code. I'm moving it into class still with computers. Uh, but just because other students have reported that some students have cheated and they think it's unfair. The whole thing baffles me. They're grad students, they're adults. Greeds don't really matter anyway. The blue book sounds like a totally plausible solution. What a what a funny way to move. We're gonna move back to cursive. The next innovation after generative AI is ways to teach cursive. <laughs> it does sound like a Black Mirror episode, Todd, doesn't it? Uh so I want I want so let's go back to threading that needle of effectively and well. So me not being as smart as you, Todd, uh to me those two words are, sound synonymous, effectively and well. So would you mind for for me and maybe someone listening who can't tell the difference, how, how do you define the difference between effective and well-written? So writing well is under the presumption that someone is going to read what we're writing, making sure that it's clear, eloquent, articulate, reflects the style and tone that we want, and complete. And you've seen beautifully written messages, beautifully written reports, beautiful, even beautifully written text messages. That you looked at and you're like, I'm not going to deal with this right now. It's too long. It's it's too nuanced. I don't have time. I'll get to it later. And often later becomes never. And so writing well, I think, is conditional on someone reading it. They get they get it. They understand it. They read it. And, they, and it's all there. And it's and it's beautifully done. Writing effectively is writing in a way that reflects the reality that everyone is busy and everyone is skimming what we write. So how do you make it easier for these busy readers to get the point? before they give up on it. And it's it's funny. So I come from a radio background, pretty much the, the polar opposite of where you come from. But when we, we were trained to write uh, using the economy of words. It's obviously not a, a phrase just known to radio, but just using the, 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 the least amount of words possible to convey impact. And that's one of the things you write about in the book is using fewer words. Because for a while there, Todd, and you, you know, you're up there in Cambridge, all the, the, the holy polloi, all the smart people, the, the way people proved to be smart was word salad. Let's just throw all these words out there. Uh, and, and all of a sudden we're realizing, as you mentioned, no one's going to sit through that crap. Um, so how do people th then again sort of convey their quote unquote intelligence by using fewer words? You have different goals. If your goal in your writing is to convey your intelligence, then I'm not really speaking to you. I, I'm talking <laughs> to people whose goal is to communicate. And and it's we should like step back and appreciate the miracle, like the true magic. I have some idea. I move my fingers in some way. Maybe if we go back to the old days, I I move my hand with the cursive. Or the future in the future it'll just be cursive. And then you read it and it goes into your head. That's the miracle we're talking about. And if I'm trying to achieve some goal of get it, of conveying something to you or even scheduling an appointment with you or conveying the key information or getting you to take some action, it's all useless if no one's going to read it. 
And that is the default behavior for readers. Is they, the, the default version of reading is quitting. And so I, like, I, like I do in my class, we can do it right now. I'd say, everybody raise your hand if you've ever received a text message, looked at it and you're like, I'll deal with that later. It's too much. And everybody has their hand up. And then I say, well, okay, so have you ever not gotten back to it? And everybody's hand stays up, right? Which is like even our shortest modes of communication. Interesting. And so how do we use those fewer words to create that impact? Like, I mean, I don't know if we use examples here or something like that, or maybe it's more of a mindset. Again, going back to our radio days, if I ever showed my boss something that was like a sentence that was like more than eight or nine words, he'd be like, yeah, you could say that in four words, right? <laughs> right. So, so yeah. is that, is that, is, is that really just come down to mindset at that point of just being like, you can say this in, in a, a, a abbreviated manner. So less is more is one of the six principles, but on this front, what has really resonated for me is when I teach people about this work, they are, they, they often express enthusiasm and relief because they say it's always been an argument about taste and style. I've argued with people and they're, and I say more concise economy of words, like you said, and then my counterpart would say, well, it sounds better. And I guess what I'm saying is it's not just a matter of taste and style. It's a matter of effectiveness. Just in this, in this principle, less is more, fewer words, fewer ideas is more likely to be read and more likely to be responded to. And it's hard. It's, it, it means cutting some of your beautiful sentences. And I'm sure that you your eight sentence thing that you gave to your boss was just really like poetry, Joe. But I'm not. sure it was, Todd. <laughs> well, this is a business podcast. Entrepreneurs listen to this, Todd. And, and one of the reasons I wanted to get you on is because more and more entrepreneurs are using content to either raise their authority, drive their business, so on and so forth. Um, but these entrepreneurs are smart. They're business minds. They're MBAs. Uh, they built multi-million dollar businesses. And they're all about what's the ROI. They they have ways to measure impact. They have Excel spreadsheets, which I still don't know how they work. Um, so how do you measure impact when something is written shorter? Do you have some sort of metric that 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 sort of weighs impact? Sure, we run randomized control trials. Your uh, your tech entrepreneurs will recognize A/B tests, and so we will do, and we've done hundreds where we'll run version A and version B. And the only thing, the only difference is we've asked you to cut it in half. So you wrote the first draft, we'll say cut it in half, and then we'll test which of them leads to more signups, more enrollments, more survey responses, more going to the website, more uh, donating. We, we did it with a large federal campaign with 700,000 donors, and we arbitrarily deleted every other paragraph. So it didn't even make sense anymore. It was a six paragraph message saying, donate to us because the other guy is bad. And we arbitrarily delete every other paragraph and increase donations. So it doesn't even make sense anymore. And so we'll do that kind of testing, with A-B test. Wow, that's impressive. That's really cool. And why is it, do you think it's just because it's just where we are in this world? Like the, the fact that we're too busy, we're too impatient. Is it just just come down to that? Because if you if you Matt, Todd, if you would again, we've been doing a lot of time travel in this conversation. But if you would if you had graduated in the '60s or '70s, would it be the same different result in terms of the impact of shorter words, economy of words, what have you? What, what what do you think it would be like? You know, generation to generation. I think everyone is busy. I don't know that we are more or less busy than we used to be. I'm, but I am sure that we have a lot, a lot more alternatives now. Uh, it, for a lower amount of effort, we can shift to entirely new content. We have inboxes that are overflowing. We have text messages that are unread. We have Slack messages that are accumulating. We have reports that we're supposed to get through or write. All those things, yes, that maybe we're more busy now or not, but what we're interested in is the world we're in now is everyone is skimming everything we write. And so if we want to make it our, our goal of, of communicating effectively to you, if we want to do that more effective, like with more success, we need to write through the lens of how do I make it easier for the reader by making it easier for the reader. It's more effective. It's also kinder. It's just nicer to the reader. In addition to being more you mentioned the word skimmer, and that's sort of what you are battling against. <laughs> that is your mortal enemy. If this was a, a Marvel movie, the skimmer is Thanos. So if you are writing in mind with you've got to stop people from skimming, what do you think are, we've talked about obviously the economy of words, keeping things short. What are other ways to combat the skimmers? 
So I actually, I, I think that I don't think the scammer is Thanos. I think the the person who's writing beautifully in difficult to read ways. That's the Thanos. People people are how they are. Like we're not going to change that. People's goal when they're reading what we're sending them is to move on and do the next thing. And so, like, I don't think we're going to change those priorities. And so instead, the actual, the, the, I don't know if, if this would be, um, Iron Man or something, but you can, we can be Marvel heroes by writing in a way that accommodates scammers. It doesn't mean saying less necessarily. So you could, by adding, we can run experiments where you add structure, headings and make it easy to skim. And it can double the likelihood someone reads past the second paragraph because they're, they're trying to just move on. And if you give them structure, they can figure out where they can find different kinds of information. So big picture is everyone is going fast. I don't think that, I don't have a judgment on that. It's just, it just is what it is. The, like our job is to find a way to navigate it and achieve our goals as communicators. And with structure, you're talking about all the sort of bells and whistles you can do with formatting, bolds, italics, all that stuff. How does that come into play? And also, how do you uh, balance that? Because you also don't want to have like 20 bullet points and different font sizes and all of a sudden, because then all of a sudden it just looks like a jumbled mess. So uh, how do you navigate that style? Oh, you got it. It's, it, it. I am embarrassed to say that it took me too long to realize that was the Thanos of writing is the, the like the circus. Like it's just you, you open something and it, it's like uh, impressionistic art in formatting. We've got we've done randomized experiments where you bold, underline, or highlight one sentence, and it dramatically increases the likelihood that someone reads that sentence. So people interpret bold, underline, and highlight as the most important content from the writer's perspective. But what that also does is it licenses them to not read anything else. And so what we've seen is that they it massively increases the likelihood of reading that, and they're like, oh, good, because I want to move on to the next thing anyway. I got it. That's the point. And so we got to do, we got to be pretty careful about what we use that kind of formatting for. We've also found that when you use lots of kinds of formatting or you bold lots of things, it's as good as nothing and probably worse than nothing because it ends up being visually unpleasant. It ends up confusing the reader on what the writer is saying is actually important. And so different readers will leave with different things. So generally we counsel people to use only one kind of formatting. And to violate the next rule we might talk about, we say use it judiciously. Hmm. And what does that mean? <laughs> what, what does judiciously mean? <laughs> well, that's what I'm saying. It's violating the next rule. The next rule is don't use words like judiciously, which is like judiciously means carefully or sparingly. And uh, the next one is make reading easy. Short sentences, short words, short, familiar, common words. And, and it, it does a bunch of things. One, it decreases the amount of effort required to read. So people, it's easier on readers. That means they're less likely to quit and they quit later. The second thing it does is it increases the readability. So more people are able to read it and understand it. So not only is it more pleasant to read, people are more likely to read it. They're more likely to read more of it. It also is accessible to more people than the original kind of Reddit. And uh, speaking, you just, you just kind of said something I was going to talk about. I was going to talk about Reddit because there was this phenomenon in Reddit for I, I guess I don't know if it's starting Reddit. You could correct me if I'm wrong, but the the TLDR phenomenon of writing a post, then TLDR too long, didn't read, and then a mini recap of a longer post. Is that what we're adding to when it comes to all this long form content? Where it's like, okay, I'm going to write this long thing, but then TLDR here's a, here's two sentences to recap what I just wrote. The way I think about it is, we as writers have goals, and when we write something, we have some high level priority. And then we have other secondary priorities. Readers have goals too. They want to full, pull out the, the main message. And sometimes they want more detail and sometimes they don't. Which is why like when people skim, they don't skim everything. They skim around and they're like, oh, I'm interested in that. And then they read that part. And then they jump back out and they move, they move into something else. And so the TLDR is for people who first, it helps people orient. Like what is this thing even about? The title was some clever play on words that's uninformative. So now let's do the TLDR is like, oh, this is what it's about. And then they be like, well, if I want more, I'll dive in. If I don't, now it's time to move on. And so like whether I, TLDR is great, that's fine. It also like in the US Army, they they have bluff, bottom line up front, first sentence of every communication from an enlisted person to a general, general to an enlisted person. First sentence is the bottom line. 
the, the point is you want to be able to get people the key information immediately and then they can decide if they want more detail. Uh, and let's go back to the entrepreneurial thing because uh, one of the things you also write about is emphasizing value. Again, value is another thing that you hear entrepreneurs talk about again. So if an entrepreneur is, is writing something, whether it's a blog post, an article for, for a website, how do you emphasize the value while you're navigating all this, being judicious with words, the economy of words, all of that? So how do you, I guess, pinpoint on the value of what you're trying to get across? We have to realize that we're not very good at taking other people's perspective. I'm going to tap a song out right now. And I want you to guess what song it is. Joe, we're going to do one of the classic experiments on perspective taking. Here it goes. Okay. What song was it? Is that the Friends theme? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Happy birthday to you. Ha- happy birthday. Oh, okay. It's happy birthday to you. Happy oh, birthday. Oh, okay. So there was a really classic study. Awesome. Where they have one person who's a clapper clap a song and then predict what percent of listeners are going to get it right. And it's like, when I know the song, of course you're like, it's so obvious. Yes. So, and and they, I guess 90% of, of listener, basically 1%, you know, basically nobody gets it, but it's just, it's hard to take the perspective of somebody else. And we, and we're pretty confident that we know what it's like to be somebody else. I say that as you're asking emphasize value, how do we do that? I care about getting whatever my goal is. But if I want to frame it and why should you care? It's a totally different question. Uh, we, we have this classic experiment, this really nice randomized experiment with Rock the Vote. They try to get people to volunteer to get young people to vote and they volunteer at concerts. One version of their recruitment said, volunteer to get people to vote. That was their subject line because that's their goal, the Rock the Vote's goal. The other condition was, volunteer at concerts from the perspective of the reader of course that the second one is four times more effective because this message is exactly the same the only thing is dude we're doing is just sort of i have my goal of getting you to volunteer but what would you care about go to the concert on the concert and in terms of who's doing it right you noticed the you mentioned the rock the vote there they did it right with the <laughs> by enticing people about the concert point of view Who's doing what you're talking about and writing about? Who Can you give me an example or two of people that are writing effectively for busy readers, whether it's it's a, a brand, a company, a, a writer? Who, who do you think is doing it? Besides, obviously, Todd Rogers and Jessica uh, Lasky Fink, besides you guys, who else is doing this effectively? I, so I, I'll think of two quick examples. One, I think the U.S. Army and a lot of the other branches of the military have done this intentionally. In their regulations, they have structured, this is how we write. And in the process, they've made it easier for writers, easier for readers, and especially easier for lower status people to communicate to everybody else because they've made it unambiguous. This is how we write. And you know exactly what structure is supposed to be. I love that. I'm going to, I'm also, you said, who, who does this uh, communicating with busy people well? I'm going to take a 80 degree turn. I really love the approach that Don Norman and user-centered design take. Don Norman wrote this book called The Design of Everyday Things. He's the founder of what's called user-centered design, which I'm sure a lot of your entrepreneurs are familiar with. And his basic starting place is if you design something and a user can't figure it out before they give up, it's the designer's fault. It doesn't matter whether the instructions are clear and it just requires some education. If someone gives up because they can't figure it out, it's the designer's fault. It's never the user's fault. And I think the exact same approach is true with writing. Even if everything is there, if we write and the reader gives up before getting everything that we eloquently wrote down, that's on us. It's always the writer's fault to achieve our goal. And so reality is, for whatever reason, people are busy, everybody's skimming, nobody has enough time, and nobody cares about our writing as much as us. And so from that perspective, the easier we make it for the reader, the more effective we'll be. And and honestly, it's always on us, the writer, never on the reader. And now that we have so many different forms of written communication, you mentioned uh, text messages earlier, which which are class, you know, obviously in the business setting, you've got email, you've got Slack, you've got project management software, where you can also communicate with your team within that. Is this a one size fits all approach? What you've laid out in your research that basically no matter what 
uh, technology you are using, you can write effective, like learning this one way of writing effectively will help you across all platforms. Yes. I say that because we are not saying how you should write. What we are saying is the starting place is understand that your reader is busy always and skimming almost always and cares about your writing as much less than you almost always. Given that, the fewer words we use, the more likely it is someone will read and respond to it. The easier it is to read in terms of famil- like short words, short sentences, the more likely someone is to respond. The more structure you impose that makes it easy for them to jump around, the more likely they will be to read and respond. All those things. How you do that is going to completely depend on context and completely depend on mode. Complete, it's going to change over time. But the reality is, whether artificial intelligence is writing it for you or not, we still have human readers on the other side. As writers, we can use AI to write it. And then we have ultimately, we are trying to convey something into someone else's head. You could say, well, you could use AI to summarize it. Fine. But if you could have written it as a summary, then you should have written it as a summary. Often we have detail because we want people for whom the detail will be relevant to have it. And so ultimately the challenge is getting it into people's heads. They're busy. And so whatever your modality or your style or your context or the era we're in, the goal the, the like demand for us as writers is to write in a way that accommodates the way people read. Excellent. And a couple of random things. Uh, let's talk about like titles and subject lines. I mean, I guess those could be sort of uh, <laughs> interchanged there. The impact of those, like the titling something or that little subject line you put in your email, how long, how short, how, uh, give me, a, g- give us a couple pointers because I feel like subject lines, especially when it comes to emails have become novellas. All of a sudden, it's like filling up the entire box, and and it feels like they've actually written their entire message inside the subject line. Obviously, that's too long, but talk to me about impact when it comes to titling something or putting something in a subject line. There are two parts to it. The first is subject line. Let's just talk about subject line for now. The challenge is getting people's attention long enough to deliver your message, right? Let's go back to 2008. I, I, I worked indirectly with the Obama campaign in 2008 and 12, running on experiments. And in 2008, the single most popular subject line, the single subject line of a fundraising email that was the most successful maybe ever of a subject line, it was lowercase h-e-y. Hey, in 2008, who would ever send you an email with a subject line, hey, it'd be a friend or some familiar person. And so what ends up happening is like, oh, hey, maybe this is someone I know. You open it you read it long enough to figure out they're asking you for money. And so at the time, that was a real breakthrough because it got people's attention. You can predict what happened after that. Everybody started writing informal subject lines. And over time, we started realizing that was just spam. And so there, there, there isn't a universal answer to what's the best subject line. The reality is everyone is busy. Everyone is skimming. And the challenge is how do we get people's attention long enough to deliver our, whatever our core message is. So you're asking whether it should be a novella or one word. I would, I like, but although I don't think, I'm not, I'm not, I don't think you have to do it, but I, I like the subject line being a very brief summary of the concepts included in the message. It's good because it helps the reader know exactly what it's about, but it also is good. And you may not care about it in the short term. It's also good at letting readers know whether they don't have to engage with this. It's kinder to the reader to let them know this is not a topic that, that it, If this is not relevant to you, skip it because we're going to have other communications with them that are relevant to them. And so it is both a service to them, but also builds trust in the relationship. Okay. And uh, I mentioned uh, titles. Uh, When you're titling something, whether it's an article or a blog, something I'm sure you've had to deal with when you're writing this book in terms of the chapters you were coming up with. You know, obviously everyone wants to be clever. Play on words is always a big thing for titles, but uh, what's, what's the hack on that? It, I don't know that there's a simple hack. It, it, the, the hack is to know exactly what your goal is. If your goal is to make it easy for someone to know the point, to decide whether they want to dive in or not, then being very clear and short on what a summary is great. If, you, if your goal is something clever that will many people will not understand what it is and decide that it's not relevant to them because they're busy and they're racing on to the next thing, then go for it. And the, the people who do read, will think it's clever and you will succeed in your goal of having some group of people, probably smaller, think that think that you're clever. Or just mention Elon Musk Trump or Trump and you know, maybe people will click. 
<laughs> All right. Last random thing before I let you go. Uh, humor. People, you know, like to be humorous when they write. And sometimes humor requires the setup and then the punchline. Uh, when you're trying to be an effective writer and you've, you've got a format of delivering something humorous, it can sometimes take a little longer to get to that punchline. Is that something that you've ever had to struggle with or navigate? Maybe it was writing a book or other of, those, of your written words? It depends where your goal is. It, it depends where your goal is. If if you if I'm working for your podcast and you and I are talking about what platform to use, I mean, kind of probably a distraction to make it too funny. Uh, but if your goal is to be funny, then you have to know the more you add, the less likely it is someone's going to read uh, to finish it. I do want to say one thing on humor. I I tend to be sarcastic in my writing and. Uh, and I try to be funny, although I will let other people decide whether I succeed. Uh, but one thing that is really true, it's very common for people not to get it. Given that, especially over writing, where you lose the intonation and the body language and all that, I, I think it's a, probably a safe assumption that readers are not going to understand that you're joking. And so you need to let them know unambiguously. So whether it's uh, parentheses JK or a smiley face, uh, there's, an, there, there's an amazing study where they brought people in and they said, write something sarcastic. They had someone else read it. And then they're like, what do you think the chance is that that person, and they said, another perspective take, understood you were being sarcastic. They're like, of course they got it at 90%. And actually they were no better than chance. They have no idea that you're being sarcastic. And so and they just assume that people aren't going to get your joke. So you can, you got to make it unambiguous. Okay. All right. Well, I have one more thing because you kind of sparked something in me. Nuance. Uh, Todd, we live in this world where nuance is dead. Like no one, it's it's either black or white. Uh, but sometimes nuance requires context to create that nuance. So how do we do that by also shortening our words, the sentences, smaller words, blah blah blah. I mean, because nuance to me, I feel is such a lost art. And if we strip too many words away, then we'll we get into that fear of everything being framed in a black and white context. So just this last about talking about nu nuance it's hard to speak in the abstract but it, it comes i almost sound like i'm i'm chat gpt responding with the exact same thing in different words uh it depends on your goals it depends on the context but honestly if what you're saying requires the nuance then it has to be included you just have to know that the longer it is the less likely someone is to get there and to read it and the the more you cut from it, the less nuance you're going to get. And there's just trade offs. I I don't I but I do think the reality is that people are skimming and they're going to lose the nuance. And so maybe you need to say the nuance itself in a more concise way. Like I like I could imagine if we're being very concrete, where you're writing something about a topic like um, you know a sales strategy, and you recommend using a certain a certain vehicle like a social media ad. But not all social media, just Instagram, for the reason that that's where our customers are. But you're writing a, a, a memo to the mar marketing leader or the CEO or whatever, and you you draw attention, like bold, you, like block bold text, underline. We need to spend more on social media. I might, and then the rest of it is qualifying what exactly that means. And I and there's nuance, and there's a lot of nuance. I might actually do some kind of cue that there's nuance. I might put an asterisk. Where I would add a finger to it, and then I and then immediately after that I do asterisk. We added this asterisk because we wanted to quote. We, we knew that you weren't going to read the entire thing, uh, but we wanted you to know that it wasn't an un, it wasn't a universal statement. It only under some subtle, specific, narrow constraints. But I but but there's not it's not a, I would definitely not recommend that as a universal answer. It depends. But ultimately, you have to be, you have to know how your reader is going to read. It's a game of judgment, and unfortunately, or fortunately, because we're human, and when the robots take over, it may take them longer to get all this. Stuff. They're gonna have a lot of trouble with sarcasm. I'm telling you, those robots are, are gonna be their their minds will probably explode trying to analyze sarcasm. But his name is Todd Rogers, the co-author of Writing for Busy Readers: Communicate Effectively in the Real World. Todd, thank you so much for the time. Good luck with the book, and please let me know if you if you go back to Blue Books at, at your school and just start. And that's uh, now your test is, and now all of a sudden now uh, it's gonna be like penmanship 101 at Harvard because. <laughs> No one knows. No one knows how to write cursive. Yeah, we're gonna we're gonna have a language requirement in grad school and a uh, cursive handwriting requirement. Yeah, so I will. Thank you, Joe. This is really fun, and uh, thanks for sharing this work with your listeners.
Absolutely, and that'll do it for another episode of the Forbes Books Podcast. Don't forget to hit subscribe, that way you get new episodes as soon as they're available. And if you have a spare moment, I would greatly appreciate it if you could leave a review, which would help other exceptional entrepreneurs like you discover the show. You can always connect with me on X, LinkedIn, and Instagram at Joe Partavilla. And please don't forget the golden rule and treat others as you want to be treated. Thanks for listening. Until next time, adios.